Let's just open the kitchen window, so let some smells out. Oh, it's not opening. No, oh, why is it not opening? Why is it not opening? Oh, the tap's in the way. Who thought of that idea? Oh, absolutely flooded. Great. Good morning and welcome to another Tomcat holiday slash battlefield vlog. And it's a cold, damp uh, February morning, but it's not miserable because it's actually my birthday today. Anyway, what's this video about? Well, tomorrow we're off back over to France to have a look at some more of the Second World War gun emplacements on the Atlantic Wall. But we've been to Normandy twice now, so we've decided we're going to Calais and Dunkirk to have a look and see, first of all, what emplacements they put there because that's originally where they thought the Germans thought the British, Canadians and Americans were going to land on D-Day. But we didn't. We outfoxed them, went to Normandy instead. So we're going to see what we've got on that side. So, first of all, Rose is on a final walk this morning because she's off to Doggy Prison at 9 o'clock. So she's not coming with us this time. And Klingons for this uh, holiday. We've got Will and uh, Will's mate Oscar. So hopefully they'll enjoy this. So let's get on with it. Let's get the old doggy walked in this miserable weather. And then we can have a nice sleep and then get over to France, hopefully. The crossing isn't going to be too bad. When you're going on a long journey like we are, always make sure you prepare your vehicle before you go. So if you need to add blue, add blue. Always check your fluid levels, so check your oil, check your water, check your brake fluid, check your engine coolant and don't forget to check the tread on your tyres and the state of your tyres. And of course always give your van a good valet before you go. Another thing I do is always set my speedometer to kilometres an hour rather than miles an hour as it could save you getting a speeding fine. And finally, if you are driving in France, you have to carry two breathalysers, which must be in date, you have to carry a warning triangle, and you have to carry high-vis vests for everybody in the vehicle. Also, you'll need headlight deflectors so you don't dazzle the oncoming traffic, because the UK headlights are set in the wrong orientation. is the holiday cottage we're staying in. We're here for a week, so let's check it out. So let's get this door open and check out the place where we're staying. 
Wow, look at the size of this room. So we've got an open plan, kitchen, dining room and living room. Which looks pretty good. So we've got a set of wardrobes for some reason here. Then we have a downstairs toilet with a wash basin. So, well, this is just a store cupboard with the Wi-Fi in it and the consumer unit. So it's not really a wardrobe, it's a store unit. This is the master bedroom. Now you have to bring your own bed in for this uh, place. Now let's check out the ensuite. So we've got a great shower. We've got a huge wash basin, but no toilet. So we've got a wardrobe here with towels in. So I guess the other side's got ready for the clothes. So this will be mine and Charlotte's room. So let's go upstairs and check and see what the boys have got. So let's get up these stairs. I do like this little landing. It reminds me of the place we stay in uh, Ross Niger in North Wales. Jane Gwen's place. So first thing we come to is another toilet but with no wash basin this time. Then we've got a bedroom with bunk beds in which the boys won't be using. Because there's three bedrooms up here, both with double beds. So this will be Will's room, I guess. Up here. Across the landing, let's go and see there. So there should be a bathroom and another bedroom. A good view of the living room. So we've got a huge bath. We've got a decent sized shower, shower cubicle. And we have another huge wash basin. Then this will be Oscar's bedroom, Will's mates. Let's check out the view from the front. So you can see we've got a little driveway there for the van. Not much of a front garden, but there is quite a big back garden. So that's the place where we're going to be staying for the next week. So looks pretty good. Things that don't make sense in this French house. Why is there a plug socket and a light switch? Right next to the wash basin in a shower room. Why is there a light switch right next to another wash basin in the downstairs WC? Let's just open the kitchen window to let some smells out. It's not opening, not op why is it not opening, why is it not opening? Oh, the tap's in the way. Who thought of that idea? Nice view out of the bedroom window, looking at the front of the house. Oh look, there's another window in the bedroom. Let's go and have a look at the window in the bedroom. Looks out onto the living room. What's that all about? Window to outside, window to inside. Makes no sense. And why is there no wash basin actually in this toilet? It makes no sense. To me at all. Now the first part of the Atlantic wall we're going to see is right on our doorstep. So just over there is the beach. So it's so a few minutes walk to uh, Vida Stan's nest 111. Vida Stan means resistance nest or she can post for us. So it's just a short walk to the beach and then we can find out what's there. So where we are staying is a hill overlooking the beach which is actually Cap Blanc Ney, which in English means Cape White Nose. And on top of that hill there is a monument. 
So this is the Dover Patrol, or later known as the Dover Patrol Force, and it is not a French monument, it's a monument to the Royal Navy Command of the First World War. They were based in Dover and Dunkirk during the First World War, and the main task was to stop the Imperial German Navy going up and down the English Channel. So let's get to the beach and check out Riederstan's Nest 111. Now the machine gun nest was placed here to protect this gap in the cliff. Riederstan's Nest 111 is a Type Regal Bow 656 personnel, which had a garrison of 15 troops, which is situated on Escalis Beach. Now you can see the tide is right in, so we're not going to be able to see the front of Riederstan's Nest 111. This is what the beach looked like in 1945. So let's go and see what there is to offer on the other side of this beach. So I can't go down the steps because the tide's going over the steps as you can see. So I'm braving it and going down this slippery slope. So as you can see, it's a pretty small part of the beach now and you can see the really stands nest on this side and this is what it looked like on this side with the tide in again in 1945. So from these pictures of 1945 you can see the cliffs are very white and chalky just like the white cliffs of Dover. Now I did manage to get this little video later on in the week of the front of the nest with the tide out. So that was uh, Vida Stan's nest, 111, just a few things, one, it's full of tourists, two, I couldn't actually get into it, and three, the tide's in and it's absolutely raining. So hopefully on the next bunker we go to, we don't have either of those predicaments. Welcome to day two, and what a beautiful sunny day we've got today. It's only 10 degrees out here, but the sun is shining and the sky is blue. But it's a complete different change from yesterday when all it did was chuck it down. So today we're going to the French fort of Vert, which in 1942 the Germans took over, rechanged it a little bit, and called it Battery Veldum. Now this morning, bright and early, we're going to see two gun batteries right near the port of Calais. So we're going to see Battery Oldenburg and Gun Battery Valden. So let's get on with it because it's about half an hour's drive from here to get over there so not too far and have a look at these two batteries. I believe uh, Valden or Valden, or however they say it, is uh, not easy to get to. So let's go and find out. So this is Battery Oldenburg, which is a German artillery battery built during World War II as part of the Atlantic Wall. It is situated east of Calais. The battery began construction in 1940 with artillery guns in open emplacements. The organisation tote built casemates around two 240 millimeter guns during the war now before we go and look at these big casemates we've spotted this little bunker here so let's check this out now i think this is a fire control bunker with an anti-aircraft gun on the top so let's go through this door on the right first and see where that takes us so it's a bit of a tank squeeze in here and it goes to a trabuc. A trabuc is a small circular reinforced concrete bunker. It was designed for one soldier, usually armed with a machine gun. Trabucs were shelters with an opening at the top. The opening gave the soldier partial protection while enabling him to sweep the area he was defending with a simple circular movement. So this is probably where an MG42 would be. So you've got a great field of fire around the area to protect the bunker. 
So it could actually be an observation post as well, but with the metal ring around here, it was more likely be a machine gun post. So let's go through this now little door and have a look at the main bunker. So the first thing you can see is we've got a machine gun nest for a MG42 overlooking the entrance. Now this space here could have been used for a shower which the soldiers would use if they thought they were under a gas attack so they could have a wash before they actually came into the bunker. So back past the machine gun and let's get into the bunker. So we've got a little space here. This could have been where the shower was. Again, doors are missing. The doors are always missing. So the space we can see at the back here is an escape hatch. So they could have used that to climb out of the back, which would have also had a big door on it. And we've got another uh, machine gun nest for a MG42. Again, overlooking the other entrance. So this looks like it's just a communications bunker. No gun in here. So let's go back outside and have a look on the roof and see if there is an anti-aircraft gun position. So yep, it says definitely an anti-aircraft gun position. So we've got a little bit of a chimney sticking out the top there. And you can now see what the Trabuk looks like from the outside. So yes, that's definitely an anti-aircraft gun position. So up here they could have used a Flak 30 or the improved Flak 38, which were 20mm anti-aircraft guns, which were used by various German forces throughout World War II. They could have also had a Flakverling 38, which was combined four Flak 38 auto cannons on a single carriage up here. As you can see up here, the anti-aircraft gun crew would have a commanding view of the surrounding area to protect the gigantic casemates. Being a gas engineer, I've got to look down the chimney. Eh, you can't see much, only a few spider webs. Anyway, let's find a way over this flooded land and get to see these gigantic World War II megastructures. Both casemates are terms, which means towers in German, are 35 metres long and 15 metres high, positioned in slight offset from each other to gain a broader range with both guns. As you can see from this picture of me in front of the casemates, you can see I am dwarfed by the size of these things. Term East and Term West, as they were known, housed guns of Russian origin that were captured by the German army during World War I and rechambered by Krupp from 255mm to 240mm so they could take the standard naval German artillery shells. The western of the two casemates term west is two storeys deep, while the eastern casemate term east is three storeys deep. The battery was under the command of the Kriegsmarine Section 2 MAA 244 from 1941 until it was captured. Battery Olgenberg was part of the coastal defence of the Straits of Dover and is situated in the Hellfire Corner. Battery Oldenburg was also known as La Moulin Rouge, which means Red Windmill in French, I believe. The battery surrendered to the Canadian forces in 1944. I can't believe this battery only took two years to build. When you look at the actual structure here, how much does that metal weigh? How did they get it up there? How did they get the guns in there with the technology they had in 1940s? It's just unbelievable. Besides these two huge casemates, the battery also had a combined fire control and hospital bunker. So, let's take a look at that. I believe the back of this bunker is open, so let's get round the back. So I just squeezed myself through that little hole there, so hopefully it is worth it. So, let's get down these stairs. 
it's the debris from the hole, I reckon. <laughs> so, mm, quite wet inside here on the floor, like they normally are. So always make sure you bring some good boots when you're going through these bunkers. This room looks properly flooded. So you can just see one of the pictures on the back wall over there. So let's take a look. Meaning my feet's going to get wet. Very strange. Very strange indeed. Is it artwork? Whatever it is, it must have took a long time to do. Just weird. Why is it here? Anyway, let's get back and get my feet wet again and continue with the exploration. I have no clue what these rooms were used for, except it was a hospital and a fire control place, so... It's a main room. Let's go and have a look at these here at the front. There seems to be a little bit of damage here. So was it hit by some naval ships? Oh, God knows what they was hit by, but there's some, definitely some damage there at the front. So that seems to be it. That's where one of the major paintings was on the back wall. I wonder what that trough was. I wonder if it was a door. Runner for a door. I don't know. <laughs> or was it a drain? I have no clue. So let's have a look in this back room here. Again, just a little tiny room. I have no clue what was in it. So let's make our way back out again and get out through this tiny little hole. Not looking forward to this, but here we go. Can't get out. <laughs> can't get blood in that, eh? <sighs> Things I do for YouTube. Now let's go and have a look and see what's on the next floor up, or the first floor. At least this hole is easier to get in. So let's get up these steps and see what we find. Well, nothing to the left anyway, so we can only turn right. More steps. Let's have a look in these rooms. Not a really clue what's in any of these or what they were used for. To see if I can find some kind of drawings for them. I guess those were the stairs for going back upstairs, but uh, we'll see them in a minute. Another empty room. More rooms. Again. I'm not a clue what's in these. So there's a big open bit here. So you can see those stairs, which I thought were they originally blocked off like that, or were they blocked off later? I don't know. Let's uh, let's have a go up these ladders and see what we can see. This should be fun. Especially if I fall off anyway. Hopefully I don't. We should get a good view from up here. What a beautiful day. It has been today. So we can see all the way around.
don't think I'll bother climbing up there because I probably will fall off so let's get back down so that's about it up here so let's get the light back on and make our way back down the steps Now on top of one of the casemates here, we've got like this viewing gallery. So I'm just having a scan around to see if I can find the battery at Veldum, because that's the next one we're going to. But you can see what a stunning day it has been today and what a fantastic view you get up here. Now normally you get to this casemate via this walkway, but it's flooded, so we can't use it. Now we can see Battery Veldum in the distance, it's been a right pain walking here so far. We're just going to get across the field and have a look in these World War II mega structures. This is a very special bunker, it's an M305, there were only ever two built and this is the only remaining one. This casemate is made of concrete and can rotate 360 degrees. So let's take a look in this one first. So let's fight through these brambles and get underneath this casemate. Oh, absolutely flooded. Great. <laughs> oh, it's too deep. Wet feet, but made it. So this is probably one of the rooms where they kept the ammunition. Let's see if I can get in this little space. So let's squash my large frame into this little hole and see what's in here. Oh, I can stand up in here. What have we got in here? Oh, wow. It's the it's a turret ring and you can see the roller bearings there quite easily now well pretty much rusted away but you can see it and there's a gap between the actual turret and the wall and you can see daylight up there wow I'm so glad I squashed myself into this little hole so uh, let's get myself out of it now So I'm so glad I came into this hole to see the turret ring and the roller bearings. So we're now back into the main pit. So this other room on the opposite side is probably another room for storing shells or uh, powder bags. So if we have a look here where the big hole is, we can see up to the top. This is where the gun was. Did they blow the gun out of this place? Anyway, so we can see the inside of the turret ring and also we can see the marker for telling the people in the pit where the centre of the gun is. So let's go and get wet again and go and check out the main gun room.
This is the experimental concrete cupola. The gun tower in the battery Valdum is the only one along the entire Atlantic wall to have a concrete housing. The rotating mechanism of the 750 ton tower came from the French battleship Provence. So the first thing we can look at is the gap between the rotating turret and the concrete base. But this is what we could see when I was looking up from underneath. So let's go inside the actual casemate and have a look around. So again we can see the hole in the floor where the gun used to be. And again it looks like they've blown the gun out of the casemate to get it out to scrap it. And this isn't the biggest casemate we've seen today. But obviously if it was any bigger they probably wouldn't have been able to put it on a revolving turret. The two holes at the back of the turret allowed the blast of air from when the guns fired to escape so they didn't injure the artillerymen. Now we've had a look at the big gun, let's have a look at this smaller bunker. Now around the back, so let's get through this door here because it's the easy way of getting in. But if it was during the war, you can see there is a machine gun nest there. So another MG42 would be firing at you. Steel doors are missing again. Shame, but there you go. In we go. So this has got a bit of damage here. So it's actually been hit by something. Probably the Canadians firing into it. So let's go into this room here. So no damage in here at all. So it looks like it didn't penetrate this far back. This will be the machine gun post. So yep, there's a machine gun nest. So this is what an MG42 looks like. MG stands for, well in English, machine gun. And 42, the year of manufacture, which was 1942. It was a 7.92 millimeter caliber gun. Rate of fire, 1,200 rounds a minute using a strip from 50 to 250 cartridges. Effective firing range, 200 to 2,000 meters or 219 to 2,187 yards. Maximum firing range, 4,700 meters or 5,140 yards. It weighed 11.5 kilograms or 25.57 pounds. Let's go into the gun room. So, oh, look at that hole. Now, was that hole made by a shell or was it made by somebody scrapping the gun? We'll never know. So you can see the damage in the corner there at the left hand side. So this damage looks like it's come through the front of the casemate. So maybe it was actually a naval ship that fired a shell through here. And it was a bloody good shot to get it in. Because that is out to sea and the Canadians attacked from the back. But that still doesn't say the Canadians didn't cause that damage. So pretty much same design as all the other bunkers we've been looking at but a little bit smaller, so it would have had a smaller gun in here. So that's a little bunker checked out. Let's now check out the three-storey observation tower. In 1944, the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division was ordered to clear out the coastal defences in the Strait of Dover. From the beaches of Normandy, they moved north into France and Belgium. On the 30th of September 1944, they reached the Battery Veldum. This bunker is another unique building for the Battery Veldum. It's a fire control bunker which can be found next to the rotating casemate. It has three levels and multi-observation heights. The entrance to the second level used to be on the outside of the building, but that is missing today. But I'm still going to try and get to the first level. So let's see if I can get my overweight old frame up here to have a look inside. So let's see if uh, crawling up here is worth it. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get a bit of view before I break my neck. I'm not holding on to anything really well here. So you can see, we can see into it now. It's just a big empty room. I don't think I'll bother crawling into there. But 
it's just a big empty room and I'm guess upstairs will be exactly the same and I don't think I'll bother climbing up there so let's get down and get round the back and see what's in the basement before I break my neck so let's have a look at the basement of this observation fire post the door or well the blast door is missing as you can see into this first room now you can see there used to be something above this door it used to be the position for this nameplate so most of the German bunkers were named by the soldiers who actually operated them whether there was equipment in here probably lots of it as well through into the observation part and you can see the slits have been bricked up now I guess they've done that to protect this place from getting bad weather in here but you can still see there's water getting in there's always water gets into these bunkers so back through the communication room and you can see the two machine gun slots have also been bricked up this entrance and exit door also had a nameplate above it so that's our little tour around the battery veldum that gun I can spin around and it's concrete absolutely amazing but word of warning it's really hard to get to this place you need to do some walking and it's just so overgrown you get uh, nettled quite a lot well I like little brambles so make sure you wear jeans sturdy boots you have been warned